True Gay Crime contains coarse language, adult themes, and content that is violent and disturbing. If at any time you feel you need help, please refer to the toll-free crisis lines in the show notes. Welcome to another episode of True Gay Crime. I'm your host, Patrick Morano. And on today's episode, we cover the story of Aileen Warnos, a.k.a. the Damsel of Death, the first woman ever to fit the FBI profile of a serial killer, and the subject of the movie Monster, starring Charlize Theron, winning her an Academy Award for Best Actress, because Hollywood loves it if you play a prostitute or ugly, and in this case, she does both. The sources for this story were Wikipedia, Murderpedia, TheCinemaholic.com, and Biography.com. So, without further ado, let's get into the story of Aileen Carol Lee Warnos. It's December 1989, and 51-year-old Richard Mallory looks out the window. It's dark outside, and it's starting to rain. He heaves a heavy sigh and wonders what he's still doing at work, and reminds himself to start looking for someone to help him out with his Clearwater, Florida electronics repair business. I mean, it's been too long since he's been able to do what he loves best, namely pick up and disappear for a few days hit the road, pick up women, drink, and party. He couldn't do that without someone helping his business. He'd put an ad in the paper tomorrow, but for now, he was closing up shop and heading home. Driving down the freeway through the pouring rain, he sees a figure of a woman standing on the side of the road. Her thumb is out, and she's soaking wet. He slows his 1977 Cadillac and pulls over and rolls down the window. Where are you headed? The dark, wet figure in the night leans over. Wherever you want to go. Mallory wasn't looking for this kind of fun tonight, but but who was he to turn it down when it presented itself? Get in. Mallory knew what she was about, and he was game. I know a little spot off the freeway in the woods. Cool, came the answer from the passenger seat. Hey, there's some vodka and pot in the glove compartment if you want. You got any beer, was the response. So Mallory pulls over to the closest liquor mart, gets the woman her beer, and continues to the woods. As the Cadillac pulls into the deserted patch of woodland, he switches off the headlights and lights a cigarette. What happens next, we don't really know for sure, but the woman would later claim that Mallory sodomized and beat her, and that's why she pulls her twenty-two caliber gun out of her purse, asks him to hand over his wallet, aims the gun straight at him, and fires three times. Two of the shots hit his left lung and killed a man. A couple days later, his abandoned car is found on the side of the road by the county deputy sheriff, and a few days after that, on December 13th, 1989, Two men hunting for scrap metal along a dirt road close to the I-95 find a body wrapped in a carpet. It's Mallory. You see, Mallory couldn't have known that on the rainy night he had picked up a woman who would soon be known as America's first female serial killer. The damsel of death, Aileen Warnos. It all starts when Warnos is born as Aileen Carol Pittman. Her friends would later call her Lee, so that's what I'm going to use for this podcast because it's easier to pronounce. She's born in Rochester, Michigan, on February 29th, 1956. Her older brother, Keith, a year earlier, is born in March 1955. Her mother is only 14 when she marries her dad, who's only 16 in 1954. Like, is that even legal? 14? How is that legal? And obviously she was pregnant, because she gives birth right right away. So she's pregnant at 14. They get married, obviously, to make it all legit, I guess. Anyway, the marriage is a complete disaster. And the couple divorce after less than two years and two months. And this is even before Lee is even born. She never even meets her dad, who goes to jail uh, about the time that she's born for molesting. He's a child molester, her father is. And so he goes to jail. Luckily for her, I mean, it, it seems at this point that she's dodged a bullet by her molester father going to jail. But nope, she doesn't, as you'll see. He's diagnosed with schizophrenia, and later he commits suicide while behind bars. As a single mom, Diane cannot cope. Well, she's a child herself, so she says the kids are crying, they're super unhappy, so she abandons them and leaves them with her parents, and she takes off in 1960 when Lee is only four years old. So, Lee's grandparents are both terrible alcoholics, of course. This girl does not get 
one break. Like when God was giving out breaks, he was like, you get some, here's a couple for you. He's, he just, he completely skipped over this woman. So her grandparents are terrible alcoholics and they legally adopt both kids. This is not going to end well for her. At six years old, Lee suffers from facial burns when her and her brother Keith are setting fires with lighter fluid. Okay, that was their fault. Like, but basically, who's watching them? Oh, right, nobody. At 11 years old, Lee is already experimenting with sex. She gives favors to the other kids at school for cigarettes, drugs, and food. Like, food? Like, she's hungry. She's so hungry. Like, her grandparents are such bad guardians that she goes to school hungry and has to give, like, hand jobs for an apple. Um, she would later confess to sex activities with her brother as well, but these are never confirmed. She also alleges that her alcoholic grandfather sexually assaulted her and beat her. Of course, the grandmother knew about it, but she was an alcoholic and she just let it go on under her roof. I told you, it's not good. At 14, she falls pregnant after being raped by her grandfather's accomplice. Now, it, and it specifically said accomplice, so it's not even like... A grandfather's friend was over, maybe minding the kids, and then something happened. It sounds like the grandfather was in the room holding her down. Like, accomplice? What a fucking shitty start to a life. Like, and, and also, as a grandfather, this is your daughter's daughter. And, and which also tells me he must have abused his own daughter, too. So maybe Aileen is his daughter, actually. I mean, it's not beyond the realm of thought that he abused his own daughter. Anyway, Lee gives birth at a home for unwed mothers in March 1971 to a baby boy. And a few months later, she drops out of school and then her grandmother dies of liver failure from all of the booze that she's piled into it. So, at 15 years old, her grandfather, I guess because she's too old for him now or something, he throws her out onto the street so, she has really not a lot of options at this point. She starts to support herself as a sex worker living in the woods near her home. Lee would grow to 5 foot 4 inches, weigh 137 pounds with brown eyes and strawberry blonde hair. She doesn't stick around long and in May 1974, at 18 years old, she's in Jefferson County, Colorado, where, for the first time, she's arrested. Not for the last time, though. For this one, she's driving under the influence, disorderly conduct, and for firing a 22 caliber pistol from a moving car. How do you even get... Okay, I mean, okay. Running with the wrong crowds. Okay, I got it. I got it, Patrick. Okay, keep going. Two years later, in 1976, she's hitchhiked to Florida because she's chasing warmer weather. She's only 20 years old when she meets 69-year-old yacht club president Louis Gratz Fell who had a comfortable life thanks to railroad stocks. So she works she works him hard, and then the two marry quickly, with the announcement of the wedding appearing in the society pages. But Lee can't help herself, and instead of concentrating on behaving herself and enjoying this newfound... Well, like, she actually kind of got a break here, if you want to think of it that way. I mean, she, you know, played the system. She's like, I'm 20-something, I'm 20, he's 69, like... If she could have just held on there, I mean, you know, he would have died eventually. She could have inherited things, and I just, but I guess her upbringing, it just, it's not happening, and this is all going to fall apart. She can't help herself, like I said, instead of concentrating on, you know, behaving and enjoying this newfound wealth and opportunity, she goes out and she gets into bar fights, and she goes to jail for assault. Then back at home with her husband, she would get angry at him when he doesn't give her enough cash. I know. So she grabs his cane and she starts hitting him with it. I mean, obviously the, the damage as a child is, is taking over at this point. Like there's no, we need, we need medication, we need therapy, we need help. Like this is the moment right now where there needs to be an intervention and we need to start dealing with these demons but we don't and so it goes on he gets a restraining order against her within weeks of saying i do then she goes back to michigan for a visit where in july 1976 she's arrested and charged with assault and disturbing the peace after throwing a cue ball at a bartender driving without a license and consuming booze in a car 
That's when her 69-year-old husband is like, fuck you, you're more trouble than you're worth, and he annuls the marriage after only nine weeks. I hope he learned his lesson. Uh, In the years following her annulled marriage, her brother Keith dies of throat cancer, and her grandfather commits suicide. So it's just sucker punch after sucker punch. She gets an unexpected cash influx from her brother's life insurance, but of course, she has absolutely no skills in handling money. She buys a car, which sounds good at first, but she totals it right away. Then she blows through the entire 10K in less than two months, and then she drifts down back to Florida, and she experiences a decade of crappy relationships and petty crimes. For example, in 1981, she's arrested in Edgewater, Florida after robbing a convenience store. Get this, she leaves the convenience store with only 35 bucks in her pocket and two packs of cigarettes, but she ends up going to jail for an entire year for that. I hope the cigarettes were worth it. A year later, she's arrested again for attempting to use forged checks at a bank, and a year after that, she's the suspect in a theft of a gun, of gun and ammo from a store. Okay, so this is this is a lot. So far, um, there's four arrests, and she's only 25 years old. In January 1986, she's arrested again. This is the fifth time. She's now 30 years old. She's in Miami, and she's charged with car theft, resisting arrest, and obstruction of justice for providing fake ID which she was using her aunt's ID, and the last name was Grody. So just earmark that for later. Miami police officers found a 38 caliber revolver and a box of ammunition in the stolen car. She loves guns. In June 1986, Volusia County deputy sheriffs detain Lee for questioning after a male companion slash John accuses her of pulling a gun on him in the car and demanding $200 from him. So Lee is found to be carrying spare ammunition and police discovered a 22 caliber pistol under the passenger seat. Did I mention she loves guns? A week later, using a new alias of Susan Blahovec, I think that's how you say it, Blahovec, she was ticketed for speeding in Jefferson County, Florida. Then, in 1986, Lee goes to Daytona Beach Lesbian Bar, and there she meets 24-year-old Taria Moore, who was then working as a hotel maid. They fall head over heels for each other, and they move in together, with Lee supporting them with her sex work. They're hot and heavy for about a year. After that, they become more like companions on the road, and they are completely inseparable for the next four years. Taria follows Lee from cheap motel to cheap motel, Sometimes sleeping in abandoned barns or in the woods. She doesn't care as long as they're together. Money's tight, but the ladies stick together. On July 4th, 1987, Daytona Beach police detained Lee and Taria at a bar for questioning where they were accused of assault and battery of some guy with a beer bottle. The ladies are now going under the aliases Tina Moore and Susan Blahovec. Aliases are very important in this story. There's a lot of them. A few months later, Blahovec slash Lee is cited for walking on the interstate and having a suspended driver's license. Well, okay. I mean, give her a break. Are you are you booking her because she's walking on the interstate? Or are you booking her because she has a suspended li- driver's license? Because guess what? She's walking on the interstate. She's not driving there. If her license is suspended, well, shouldn't you give her props for walking and not driving? I guess walking on the interstate is illegal. Okay, Lee is walking the interstate, obviously, because that's where she finds her Johns. As an exit-to-exit interstate sex worker, she was never really a hot commodity. She's got a low market value, and that was falling all the time. But she later claimed to have been making, get this, $1,000 a week having sex with 40 to 50 men course she's a compulsive liar so we don't know what to believe but the truth is the pair were barely scraping by and something had to give things were reaching a boiling point in march 1988 oh we're getting close to 1990 uh lee now using a different alias of cammy marsh green three names serial killer i told you accuses a Daytona Beach bus driver of assault, claiming he pushed her off the bus after an argument with Tyria listed as a witness to the incident. Then, four months later in July, a Daytona Beach landlord accuses Tyria and Blakovic slash Lee of vandalizing their apartment, ripping out the carpets and painting the walls dark brown without his permission. I mean, 
The fact of painting your walls dark brown, I mean, I would have gone to the police anyway. Whether or not they vandalized the apartment, I'd be like, dark brown, ladies, come on. Book them. She loves to make trouble, and in November 1988... Blakovic slash Lee. Okay, I'm going to drop that. It's just Lee. You know who I'm talking about, right? Lee goes on a six-day campaign of threatening calls against a, a Zephyr Hill supermarket following an altercation over lottery tickets. So basically anything. She's just like looking for trouble anywhere she can go. She, uh, she just feels like everyone is against her, basically. Okay, now we're going to get into the murders. Everything until this point, her entire life has led to this moment, the murder of her first victim, and the opening story of this episode, Richard Mallory. So as we already know, he's a 51-year-old who picks up Lee on a rainy night in late 1989, and it would be the last thing he ever does. Fingerprints taken from the badly decomposing hands prove it's him, which I googled because I'm like, I I didn't know this, but I'm like, decomposing? In my head, it it takes bodies like months or years to decompose. Not the case at all. Let me enlighten you. I did the research for you. You're welcome. 24 hours to 72 hours after death, the internal organs decompose. 24 hours? That's not a long time. Like, in, so you're not even, you're dead basically a day and your, like, intestines and liver and kidney are decomposing? That's incredible. Um, then, three to five days after death, the body starts to bloat and blood-containing foam leaks from the mouth and nose, which sounds gruesome. So you're all bloaty and weird. And then and then 8 to 10 days after death, the body turns from re- green, which, okay, when did it turn green? Now you're green? And then it turns to red as the blood decomposes and the organs in the abdomen accumulate gas. Oh, I wonder if you'd fart that out or something. Because I know you also relieve yourself, don't you? I mean... <sighs> Can we catch a break? I mean, shouldn't decomposing be a, a beautiful process? Like something that's really elegant and... Well, not sexy, but... Oh God, that was weird. Um, you know what I'm saying. Like, Can't decomposing be like... Cute? Why does it have to be disgusting? Like, why do we start as cute babies... And then we end as like bloated green monsters? That's a story for another podcast. Okay, back to Mallory. After his murder, Lee lays low for a few months until mid-1990, during which time the police try to follow a path of sordid dealings and shady characters that made up Mallory's life, leading them to a stripper named Chastity, which ended up going nowhere, and the case goes cold. About six months later, 47-year-old David Spears, no relation to Brittany, is a heavy equipment operator and construction worker, was declared missing on May 19th. Two weeks later, his body is found off of Route 19 in Citrus County, Florida. He's completely naked, except for a baseball cap. He has six bullet wounds made by a 22 pistol. So I was um, interested also about guns, because I don't know anything about it. So I googled, how lethal is a 22 caliber pistol? And the answer is, quite lethal. In fact, it's one of the most dangerous firearms known to man. What? Did you know that? I didn't know that. Now we know. The twenty two is very lethal. Okay. I just thought I, I wanted to clarify that for you. They find his truck after that on the I-75. The doors are unlocked and the license plates are missing, which is going to become her MO moving forward. Then, the next month, on June 6, 1990, 40-year-old Charles Karskaden is a part-time rodeo worker. He's found in Pasco County. He has nine bullet wounds in his lower chest and upper abdomen from a 20 caliber weapon. The body is wrapped in an electric blanket and it's decomposing badly. Witnesses say they saw a woman matching Lee's description driving his car and a pawn shop confirms that Karskaden's gun was sold to them. Then on the 4th of July... While people party and fireworks explode in the distance, Rhonda Bailey is enjoying the festivities from the safety of her porch. But what she thought would be a quiet night changed when a car comes skidding off the road near her place and crashes into the shrubs. She sees two women clamoring to get out of the car, throwing beer cans into the woods. I mean, like, you got, why do you have to be, like, can't you just be a serial killer? You also have to litter? And swearing loudly, the brunette, who 
we find out later is Tyria, is relatively quiet, while the blonde, who is Lee, is loud and her arm is bleeding from the crash. The blonde woman begs Rhonda Bailey not to call the cops, using the excuse that her father lives up the way and he's going to be super upset by what happens. So Rhonda watches as the two women get back in the car with the now smashed windshield, among other damages, and they drive off. They don't get too far before the car dies, and they get out and they start to walk. Hubert Hewitt of the Orange Springs Volunteer Fire Department responds to a call about the accident. On the way, he sees the women walking down the road and asks if they're the ones, you know, that were in the accident. Lee curses at him, says it's not them, and to leave them alone. So he's like, okay, well, fuck you, ladies. I was just trying to help. He leaves, and they walk on. Deputies find the car where they left it, a four-door gray 1988 Pontiac Sunbird. The glass of the front doors and the windshield are smashed. There are bloodstains inside, and... Again, the plates are missing. A quick search reveals that the car belongs to Peter Seams, a 65-year-old retired merchant seaman, a man who devoted much of his time to a Christian outreach ministry and who had left his home in Jupiter, Florida, driving up to Kansas to see his relatives. Obviously, he never made it there. Investigators send out a nationwide teletype. The fuck's a teletype? with descriptions of the two women seen with his car and sketches are sent to the Florida Criminal Activity Bulletin. Prints from the car would later match a palm print of Lee on the interior door handle. Peter Seams' body, however, is never found. Ever, ever. Like, to this day, we have never found the body. Then, on July 30th, 50-year-old Troy Duress gets into his delivery truck and leaves the Gilchrist sausage plant in the morning to make his rounds. That afternoon, he doesn't return, and his manager, Johnny Thompson, starts calling around and realizes Troy never made his last few deliveries. At 2 a.m., Barres's wife reports him missing. At 4 a.m., Marion County Sheriff deputies find his truck on the shoulder of State Road 19. It's unlocked. The keys are missing. Five days later, there's a family. They're out for a picnic in Ocala National Forest. They discover his body in a clearing off of Highway 19, eight miles from where his truck was found. He was so decomposed by the Florida humidity and heat that only his wife could identify him from his wedding ring. Why didn't they steal the wedding ring, though? He died from a twenty-two caliber gun, one shot to the chest, and one to the back. I guess we can assume that Troy Duress, who was delivering sausages, was also delivering his sausage to sex workers that he was picking up on the side of the road. Because he's out, he's driving around in his truck he obviously stopped like she was working that day she's on the side of the road he obviously stopped to pick her up on september 10th 1990 56 year old retired u.s air force major and chief of police dick humphreys was celebrating his 35th wedding anniversary they had a lot to celebrate not only was it their anniversary but tomorrow would be his last day of work at the somerville office of the florida's department of health and rehabilitative services specializing in abused and injured children. He was being transferred to the Ocala office. He was getting a promotion. But when he went to work on September 11th, he would never come home. His body's recovered the next day on the 12th in Marion County. He's fully clothed and has six gunshots in the head and torso. His car is found in Suwannee County. So, okay. We have to assume that these men are getting in their cars, going to work, but in the commute from their homes to work or on their delivery trucks or on their lunch breaks, you know, they're on the road and they're picking up sex workers. This must be more common than we know. Here's the last one. Two months later, in November 1990, Walter Antonio, a truck driver, security guard, and police reservist, is found nearly naked near a remote logging road in Dixie County. He's shot four times, and five days later, his car is found in Brevard County. Lee would steal from her victims and pawn whatever she could, including stuff from her first victim, Mallory, and her last one, Antonio. Although she was using her aliases, police were able to trace it back to Lee using thumbprints left on pawn shop carts. I mean, talk about leaving a trail. You're even leaving your fingerprints all over the place, in cars, at pawn shops, and... So with the money, Lee would pay for another night at some cockroach-infested roadside motel for herself and Tyria. 
In November, Reuters runs a story about the murders with sketches of the two women, and leads start to pour in. Police get a tip from a man in Homosassa Springs. There's a place called Homo Sasa, like sassy homo. And oh, and gets this it's near Beverly Hills, Florida. <laughs> Can you imagine? Where do you live? Beverly Hills, Florida. Um, the guy says the two women rented a trip. Okay, so the guy in Homo Sasa Springs says that the two ladies rented a trailer from him a year ago and they said that their names were Tyria Moore and Lee. A woman in Tampa said the women had worked at her motel south of Ocala. She said their names were Tyria Moore and Susan Blahovec. And yet another tip identified them as Ty Moore and Lee Blahovec, who had bought an RV from him. He said Lee was the one in charge. She was a truck stop sex worker, and the two were lesbian. Well, how does he know so much? I mean, wait a minute. They bought an RV from him? when in that transaction would it come up that she's a, a truck stop sex worker, <laughs> I guess. But the biggest break comes from Port Orange, near Daytona, where police are tracking Lee Blakovic and Tyria Moore. They stayed at the Fairview Motel in Harbor Oaks, where Blakovic registered under her other alias, Cami Marsh Green. Now the police have three names, and they're running criminal checks for Tyria Moore, Susan Blakovic, and Cami Marsh Green. Tyria doesn't have much. She has, uh, she actually does have a break-in entry charge from 1983 that had been dropped. Blakovec actually has a charge of trespassing. Green has nothing on her record at all. Little do police know that the real name of the person they should be looking into is Aileen Warnos or Lee. It's and it's actually the green ID is the one that pays off best for police. Volusia County officers check area pawn shops and found Cami Marsh Green had pawned a camera and a radar detector and left a thumbprint on the receipt. These items belong to Richard Mallory, our first victim. Then in Ormond Beach, Lee slash Green pawned a set of tools that matched the description of those taken from, from David Spears's truck. The thumbprint was the nail in the coffin for Lee. At first, the automated fingerprint identification system found nothing on the initial search, but it came to Volusia County and they began a hand search. Within an hour, they find it. The print shows up on weapons charges, an outstanding warrant against a Lori Grody. Remember at the beginning I said Grody? Earmark it. Here she is. Lori Grody. Another one of Lee's aliases. That print is also found in Peter Seam's Sunbird. This info is sent to the National Crime Information Center. The results are conclusive. Lori Grody, Susan Blakovec, and Cami Marsh Green are all aliases for Eileen Lee Warnos. The hunt is on in January 1991 for the Damsel of Death. Two undercover police officers going under the codenames Bucket and Drums, pretending to be drug dealers from Georgia, hit the street looking for leads. Then on January 8th, Bucket and Drums see Lee at the Port Orange Bucket and Drums? Sorry, I can't I can't keep going with a straight face. Bucket and Drums. What kind of like code names are those? Is that like Kentucky Fried Chicken? That's what I'm picturing. Like a bucket of wings, a bucket of drum, bucket and drums. Like one guy's bucket, the other guy's drums. Is it a drum set? Bucket? Anyway. Um, they find her at a Port Orange pub. The takedown was meant to be slow and methodical, but Port Orange police, of course, as they do in most TV shows and movies, they fuck it up. They storm into the pub and they take Lee outside. But Buck and, and Drums are there and they call their command post at the Pirate's Cove Motel. I mean, that sounds like a dive. Pirate's Cove Motel. I feel dirty just saying the word. Um, anyway, that's where authorities from six jurisdictions are stationed to work on the case. Port Orange police were apparently just doing their jobs, but the Volusia County Sheriff's Office called the Port Orange police and told them not to arrest Lee and that the sheriff's office had their own wheels in motion. The police let her go, and she heads back to the bar where Bucket and Drums are, are waiting. It's like a bad sitcom. Or I feel like they, they need to have like a, a pet with them too, like a German Shepherd. Bucket and Drums. Oh, or it's probably a guy and a German Shepherd. Like one is Bucket, the other is Drums. Uh, anyway, they strike up a conversation, and um, they buy her some beers. All right. So she leaves around 10 p.m., turning down a ride from the undercover cops. She walks down the road to another bar called The Last Resort, and Bucket and Drums follow her there. 
They keep her chatting in the bar and they buy her more beers. The undercover cops leave just after midnight, but Lee doesn't leave the last resort. She spends the last night of her life outside of bars, sleeping on an old car seat in the bar. Nothing but class. The next day, Bucket and Drums return to the last resort, talking up Lee and wearing wires. But there's a huge barbecue planned at the bar that day and tons of bikers are about to show up any minute, so the men have to work fast. They ask Lee if she'd like to freshen up at their motel. She accepts, and they go outside. Like, what? This is... She really lives a dangerous life. I mean, she's a dangerous person. She killed all these people, but... I mean, two strange men are like, hey, want to freshen up at our motel? Like, that's... That's, that's like... That's like murder slash rape 101. Anyway, so she accepts, and they go outside. In the parking lot, the Marion County Sheriff officers tell her she's under arrest for an outstanding warrant for Lori Grody. They don't say anything about the murders, and nothing is said to the media. They're trying to play it cool at this point. There, there's no murder weapon, and there's no sign of Tyria Moore. So, on January 10th, police locate Tyria, finally. She's in Pennsylvania, living with her sister. Police read her her rights, but they don't charge her with anything, but they swear her in and they start to interview her. Tyria says that she knew nothing about the murders and that Lee confessed to her that she had killed a man. Tyria tells police, quote, I told her I didn't want to hear about it. And then anytime she would come home after that and say certain things telling me about where she got something, I'd say I didn't want to hear it. Like, what a bitch. She's totally doing that, what is it, plausible deniability. She's all like... I know that you're out there killing people and I'm absolutely profiting from this, but I don't want to hear any of the details or names or what you did because the more I know, the more I'm going to be implicated and down the road, that's going to come to bite me in the ass. So just, shh, 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 just show me the money. She tells them I was just scared. She always said she'd never hurt me, but then you can't believe her. So I don't know what she would have done. Investigators take Tyria back to Florida to help with the investigation because she's being very helpful because she's trying to save her own ass. They want Tyria to get a confession from Lee. And to do this, they stick Tyria in a Daytona motel and they have her call Lee in jail. They tape the conversation where police tell Tyria to convince Lee that investigators are talking to her family and they want to pin the murders on him. Their hope is that Lee, out of loyalty ty to Tyria, would feel bad and confess. So on the first call, Lee says, I'm only here for that concealed weapons charge in 86 and a traffic ticket. And I tell you what, man, I read the newspapers and I wasn't one of those little suspects. Lee's a killer, but she's not stupid. She knows that the jailhouse phones are monitored and she tries speaking in code when she can. Quote, I think somebody at work, where you worked at, said something that it looked like us. And it isn't, see? It's a case of mistaken identity. I mean, that's a actual, actually a quote. But doesn't it sound like from a 1950s? And it isn't, see? Like, let me read that like a, like a black and white, like, fast-talking P.I. I think somebody at work, where you worked at, said something like it looked like us. And it isn't, see? It's a case of mistaken identity. For days, the conversations went on, and the more they talked, the more Lee clued into what was going on. So she basically figures out that Tyria was not alone in that motel room, and that she's trying to get a confession out of Lee. And as time went on, Lee gave in, not wanting to drop her ex-girlfriend in the shit. So she does have a heart. Quote, Just go ahead and let them know what they need to know, what they want to know, or anything, and I will cover for you, because you're innocent. I'm not going to let you go to jail. Listen, if I have to confess, I will. And on January 16th, she does just that. Now, as we all know, these types of cases are sensationalized by the media, and it wasn't long before the book and movie offers were pouring in for detectives, relatives, Tyria, and even Lee, who thought that she was going to be rich off of her own story. But Florida has a law where a criminal can't profit in that way, which, I mean... God, okay, if that's a law in Florida, then it must be a law in every other single state in the United States, because I feel like Florida would be the most lax when it comes to something like that, and if it's a law for them, it must be a law for everybody. It should be a law for everybody. You can't just commit crimes and then profit off of it. Okay. 
At the time, you couldn't turn on the news or pick up a paper without seeing her face. She felt famous because, guess what? She was famous. Within two weeks of her arrest, Lee and her attorney had already sold the movie rights to her story. Investigators in her case did the same, and the case resulted in several books and movies, including, as I mentioned, Monsters, starring Char Charlize Theron, who won the Best Actress trophy for the role. And even an opera was written on the life of, quote, America's first female serial killer. The movies and books, I understand, but, like, are you ready for a nutball piece of this puzzle? Among all of this crazy shit comes a woman called Arlene Prowl, a 44-year-old born-again Christian who runs a horse breeding and boarding facility near Ocala. She sees Lee's picture in the newspaper, and she writes to her, quote, My name is Arlene Prowl. I'm born again. You're going to think I'm crazy. But Jesus told me to write you. She gives her home address and phone number, and on June 30th, Lee calls her for the first time. Prowl becomes protective of Lee and her biggest supporter. Okay, it's not just me, right? This is totally Carol Boone and Ted Bundy all over the place, right? Uh, so Prowl tells Lee that her defenders are trying to profit from her story, and she tells and she helps her get new attorneys. Prowl speaks on behalf of Lee to reporters, describing her relationship with Lee to a Vanity Fair reporter as, quote, a soul binding. We're like Jonathan and David in the Bible. It's as though part of me is trapped in jail with her. We always know what the other is feeling and thinking. Okay, who's more unhinged? Lee or Prowl? To another reporter, she says, quote, if the world could know the real Aileen Warnos, there's not a jury that would convict her. Like, let's break this down. This Prowl bitch is just in it for some quick cash and some quick fame. Because for the next year, Prowl gets on talk shows and she's in tabloids. She's talking to anyone who will listen to her about what she thinks is the real story of Aileen Warnos. She tells everyone about her troubled past and condemns those who tried to profit with books and movies like the detective's attorneys and especially Tyria Moore. Uh, but meanwhile, she is running around, grabbing cash from wherever she can get, raising her profile and uh, getting some mini fame in the process. Then, oh no, I can't go on. This is too stupid. Maybe I'll skip this part. Okay, fine, I'll just, okay, I'm just reporting on what happened. Do not shoot the messenger. But on November 22nd, 1999, Arlene Prowl and her devout Christian husband, they legally adopt Lee. Prowl says, quote, God told me to do it. Um, Lee is 35 years old at this point. Why are you adopting her? I mean, you know, there's people that need help inside of prison, and there's a lot of people that need help outside of prison. She hasn't committed any crimes, but hasn't she? <laughs> I mean, geez. At the trial. Okay, let's go to the trial. At the trial, Lee's attorneys hammered out a plea deal where she would plead to six charges and get six consecutive life sentences to avoid the death penalty. But one state attorney thought otherwise. He felt she deserves the death penalty. And so on January 14th, 1992, Lee goes to trial for the murder of her first victim, Richard Mallory. It's a murder where their witnesses and evidence are piled up against her. There's basically no doubt that she did it. Evidence like the medical examiner stating that it took Mallory 20 minutes of agonizing pain to die. Um, meaning, was it really self-defense? I mean, you just tortured him. Evidence like Tyria saying Lee didn't seem remorseful, upset, or drunk after the incident. So way to turn on your ex-girlfriend. That's nice. Evidence like introducing the Williams Rule, which is a Florida law that allows other crimes to be admitted if it helps establish a pattern of behavior. So because of this rule, her other crimes were also brought to trial. This, of course, is bad news for Lee since her whole case is built on self-defense. This would have seemed a lot more believable if the only victim was the first, Mallory. But now that the courtroom could hear about the other victims... Self-defense doesn't sound as plausible. The trial is a bit theatrical, which I guess is a sign of the times, because remember, the OJ trial is only three years later. At the trial, state attorney John Tanner says, quote, she was a homicidal predator. She was like a spider on the side of the road waiting for prey. Men. I mean, if that's not a theatrical sentence, I don't know what is. They, were, they even played a tape of her confession where she says, quote, I took a life. I'm willing to give up my life because I killed people. I deserve to die. One of Lee's public defenders didn't want her to testify, but Lee insisted she wants to tell her side of the story. 
problem was her story had changed from her confession until now. Her claim was that Mallory raped, sodomized, and tortured her, but the cross-examination really just tears her to shreds. As the trial goes on, she gets really frustrated and angry and blurts a lot of shit out in court. But get this. Okay. Are you sitting? You need to sit down. Grab a chair. Stop what you're doing. Grab a chair. It's time for a segment I like to call Imbecilic Investigators. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so according to Lee, right, what she's telling the courts and the jury is that she shot Mallory only after he attempted to violently rape her. Unfortunately for her, there's no evidence of this. But during the investigation, had the police run Mallory through the FBI computer system, they would have found that Mallory actually did spend a full decade behind bars for what? What do you think? Yup, violent rape. But they didn't do that. So it's not part of the trial. Can you imagine? He actually was a convicted rapist. Her attorneys told her not to answer any more questions. They're like, girl, shut up. You're making it worse, bitch. And she invokes the Fifth Amendment about 25 times. She's the only witness for the defense, and it was obvious the way that this was going. The defense tries to prove that Lee is mentally ill and suffers from borderline personality disorder from her upbringing, making her, quote, a damaged primitive child. She's assessed using a psychopathy checklist and scores 32 out of 40. But that's not good news. Like, usually you want a high score, but not on the psychopathy checklist score. Scores of 25 to 30 get a diagnosis of psychopathy. And she's over that. So, on January 27th, the judge sends the jury to deliberate. They return with a verdict in less than two hours. Lee is found guilty of first-degree murder. And as they leave the courtroom, she says, quote, I'm innocent. I was raped. I hope you get raped, scumbags of America. Of course, they had this outburst in the top of their mind the next day when it comes down to sentencing. And the next day, whether or not her little tantrum made a difference in the eyes of the jury, they unanimously recommend the electric chair on January 31st, 1992. Then on March 31st, 1992, Lee pleads no contest to the murders of Humphreys, Barres, and Spears, saying she wanted to, quote, get right with God. In her statement to the court, she says in part, I wanted to confess to you that Richard Mallory did violently rape me, as I've told you, but these others did not. They only began to start to. She ended her monologue by turning to assistant state attorney and saying, quote, I hope your wife and children get raped in the ass. It's like she was almost there, like she was being real and kind of vulnerable and speaking her truth, and then she brings up raping in the ass. Like... Then, a month later, she pleads guilty to the murder of Karskadden, and she gets another death sentence. The defense at this point finds out that Mallory was actually a violent rapist. Oh, better late than never. Actually, not in this case. It's too late. But no one cares at this point. Lee is in too deep, and she's not going anywhere, and there's no retrial. In February 93, Warnos pleads. Lee pleads guilty to the murder of Antonio and is sentenced to death again. I mean... Just kill her already. How many death sentences are you... Just, I mean, you can only kill her once, right? No charges are brought against her for the murders of Seams as his body is never found. In all, she gets six death sentences. All right. On to the jail. They throw her into the Broward Correctional Institution death row for women. She appeals and she's denied by the U.S. Supreme Court in 96. Then in 2001, she sends a petition to the Florida Supreme Court. She says she wants to dismiss her legal counsel and stop all upcoming appeals, famously saying, quote, I killed those men, robbed them as cold as ice, and I'll do it again, too. There's no chance in keeping me alive or anything because I'd kill again. I have hate crawling through my system. I am so sick of hearing this she's crazy stuff. I've been evaluated so many times. I'm competent, sane, and I'm trying to tell the truth. I'm one who seriously hates human life and would kill again. I mean, that's pretty clear. There's not not a lot of room for interpretation there. Um, For me, though, I mean, obviously, I'm not an expert on the criminal justice system in the United States or anywhere. But um, why does it take so fucking long on death row? Like, if you're found guilty, shouldn't there be like a, a week later and you're dead? Like, what's with all the appeals? I, I, I feel like it's it's... Um, well, I guess the appeals must work sometimes. And that's why they do it. Also, like, the lawyers are making money off of this, right? Like, you're still, as long as you're alive, 
they have you as a client and they're making money. Is that right? If somebody knows, can you let me know? Drewgaycrime at gmail.com. Thanks. Of course, her attorneys are like, uh, no, no, she's crazy. She can't make a decision like that. Um, but psychiatrists disagree and Lee gets her way. So in 2001 interview with ABC affiliate WPLG in Miami, she says, quote, I was sentenced to death. I need to die for the killings of these people. I mean, just like she wants to die. Just kill her. <laughs> like, and, and also, why does she get to do interviews at all? Like, doesn't it give the perpetrator like a chance to clean up their image, alter the story, throw around fake news? Like, ugh. I mean, Hollywood must like it because it keeps the story relevant and it keeps them top of the news cycle and stuff like that. But for the victims' families, like, who's thinking about the victims' families? Oh, right. No one. No one cares. In 2002, Lee starts accusing prison matrons of spitting and pissing in her food. She says she overhears guards, quote, trying to get me so pushed over the brink by them, I'd wind up committing suicide before the execution and, quote, wishing to rape me before execution. She also complains of strip searches, tight handcuffing, door kicking, frequent window checks, low water pressure, mildew on her mattress, and catcalling. I mean, you're on death row. You're not staying at the Ritz-Carlton. She threatened to stop showering and eating when certain officers are on duty. Quote, in the meantime, my stomach's growing, oh, growling away, and I'm taking showers through the sink of my cell. Her attorney says... Quote, Miss Warnos really just wants to have a proper treatment, humane treatment, until the day she's executed. So then they do set a hearing to listen to all her allegations against the prison guards and stuff, but then they just um, reject the allegations and they, they just dismiss the whole thing. In the weeks before her execution, Lee does a series of interviews and talks about, quote, being taken away to meet God and Jesus and the angels and whatever is beyond the be Girl, they don't want to see you. They don't want you there. In one interview, she says, oh, this is actually makes me sad. In one interview, she says, quote, you sabotaged my ass. Society, the cops, and the system. A raped woman, get, a raped woman got executed and was used for books and movies and shit. Her final on-camera words were, quote, thanks a lot, society, for railroading my ass. Well, I mean, she's not entirely wrong there, but we'll talk about that in a second. The day of the execution, Lee is woken at 5.30 a.m. She gets a towel and a washcloth to wash her face. One prison spokesperson says she is very calm this morning, not as talkative as she's been in the past. Lee declined the traditional last meal, which would have been anything she wanted for under $20. You know how I feel about last meals. And instead was given a cup of coffee. I mean, what's the point? A half dozen anti-death penalty demonstrators are outside the prison, but they're outnumbered by corrections officers. At the last resort bar, remember, this is where she was apprehended, um, in 1991, two dozen patrons gather to wait for word of her death. They drink coffee, beer, and eat danishes provided by the owner. Then Lee makes her final statement, and there's no time, there's basically no time limit on your final statement, but it probably only took her about 30 seconds. She said, quote, I'd just like to say I'm sailing with the rock and I'll be back like Independence Day with Jesus June 6th. Like the big movie, big mothership and all, I'll be back. And anyways, you know how I feel about last statements. Last statements and last meals. Like, they shouldn't have that opportunity. Okay. Personalizing. Lee is strapped to a gurney and hooked up to two intravenous lines. A brown curtain is pulled back and 32 witnesses are there to watch. She turns to them, makes a weird face, rolls her eyes and turns away. All she can do is move her head. Then an executioner pumps deadly chemicals into her system through both of her arms. Uh, you might remember she was actually condemned to the electric chair, but that had been abolished by now. So it's just the uh, lethal injection. Lee is pronounced dead at 9.47 a.m. And back at the last resort bar, a couple of patrons toasted with bottles of Bud Light. And it's heard said, quote, well, she picked a beautiful day for it. She's cremated. Her ashes are scattered under a tree in Michigan by her childhood friend. Oh, my God, that poor tree. The tree's like, why are you dumbing this shit at my feet? Like, what the fuck did I ever do to you? Lee is the first woman to be executed in Florida since Judy Bonanena Buen... Bueno Ano. Since Judy Bueno Nano, Bueno Ano, 
since Judy Buenano, God, I can't say that. Buenoano, 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 Buenoano was electrocuted March 30th, 1988. Lee, 46 years old, become the 10th woman executed in the United States since the death penalty resumed in 1976. And so ends the tragic story of a woman who was dealt a shitty hand and then shat it right back into men to try to regain the control she had never had over her life or her body. Did she even stand a chance? We'll never know. So... There's a bunch going on here. I think we need to address, first of all, her childhood. I mean, the mom's gone. The dad commits suicide. The grandma looks away. The grandpa molests her, passes her around to friends. She's pregnant at 14. She's on the streets at 15. Like, this is when the moment somebody had to step in. Like, somebody needed to step in here, but nobody was able to intercept this tragic trajectory. Um. You know, it, it, she obviously had the, the wiring, could have gone either way. She was already wired a certain way. She Oh, she was uh, antisocial. She, she suffered from antisocial and borderline personality disorders. You know, so she's already wired a certain way. All you needed to do was like fuck with that wire, just sort of push the right buttons and then that wiring would sort of and then go, right? And it's like they were pushing every single button to just make sure she was going to turn out a monster. And I'm not condoning what she did or absolving her of responsibility, but, you know, this didn't happen in a vacuum. She wasn't just some psycho. You know, this is, she had mental health issues, and she they just, a constant abuse. I mean, I, I can't even imagine one of those things happening for me, and then, but all of them happened to her. Um also, there's a there's a whole slew of people who feel that the whole case was mishandled, that she was unjustly put to death, uh, basically by a homophobic and misogynistic judicial system. Um, from everything from they were when they were trying to catch her, you know, having Tyria set, setting her up, um, the movie and book deals before she was even arrested. Um, basically, it's to the benefit of the pocketbook of the cops and investigators and anybody involved that she is arrested and convicted because they had already sold the movie and book deal. So it's almost like the conclusion was already there before the trial even happened. Um, also side th during that time, also officer Brian Jarvis, who was initially the chief investigator on the case, he was removed from the case uh, when he questioned the conduct of the colleagues on the case. He later reported vandalism to his house theft of his records on the case and threats against him and his family. Um, also, like, let's talk about homophobia. During the trial, apparently prosecutors made repeated references on Lee's romantic relationships with women. Basically, they wanted to really drill it into the heads of the jury. This is a lesbian. 80% um, of women on death row in Florida are lesbians. And even though Lee has never considered herself a lesbian, or identified herself that way, they were using that against her in the court. And then there's the misogyny. Tens of thousands of women are in prison in the U.S. for killing men who abuse them. And a study by the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence finds, uh, found that women found that men who kill their wives or girlfriends serve an average of two to six years. Well, that doesn't seem long enough for murder. Two years. While women who kill their male partners serve an average of 15 years. Um, just, and then as an example of somebody who got the opposite kind of treatment, Ted Bundy, he had offers from several well-known private criminal attorneys to defend him pro bono. His defense team included five public defenders and a volunteer consultant on jury selection. On the other hand, for Lee, she had to rely on overworked public defenders. Um, and then, of course, was it self-defense? You know, we know that Lee was working as a highway sex worker at the time. All the men she killed were men who picked her up and who, she says, violently attacked her. But Lee was picked up by many other men during this period, and um, she didn't harm them in any way. Several men actually testified that they spent days or weeks with her, and she never threatened them. Wait a minute, weeks? That sounds expensive. Just to spend weeks with anybody? Or did they pay for that whole time? Obviously, sex work, and then especially highway sex work, I mean, is going to be extremely dangerous. 
the chances of somebody attacking you are so much higher, obviously. Point is, she murdered people. I, I, I guess the point is, she had a horrible start to, I mean, that doesn't even begin to, she had the worst start to life. Um, her wiring in her head was already predisposed to snapping. Um, and then just wrong choice after wrong choice. And then it, she just couldn't get out of the cycle. Men abusing her. She's doing sex work. Obviously, there was some assaulting going on. I mean, her first victim spent 10 years as a violent rapist, you know, getting help or behind bars and stuff. So this one is hard because it is a sad story. It's a sad story who just uh, of somebody who just never had a chance ever from from day one. This was just going to nobody would help her. Everyone just took advantage, abused her. And the wiring in her head was just so that this was going to be the result. So this is the way it was going to happen for her. Thank you for listening. And I'll see you in the next episode of True Gay Crime. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure to find the True Gay Crime Facebook page and follow us on Instagram at True Gay Crime. And we'd love to hear from you. Do you have an LGBTQ crime story from your city? You can send your story to truegaycrime at gmail.com and I'll share it on a future episode of the show. Did you know you can subscribe, rate, and review True Gay Crime on Apple Podcasts? It would mean everything to me if you did, because it helps me create content you like, and it lets Apple know to share it with more people. Thank you for listening. And remember, always look behind you, lock your doors, tell someone where you're going, and look out for each other. Why can't we all just get along?